All right, so we're going to continue on today with some important concepts related to culture. I have to tell you that I realized this semester that it's probably getting close to time for me to retire when I actually had a student in one of my college classes that didn't know who Pink Floyd are. It crushed me. But at any rate, I'm going to assume that most of you do know who Pink Floyd is and know their music. So one of their most popular songs was Another Brick in the Wall. And there's a phrase in the song where a teacher or a principal yells at a student, if you don't eat your meat, you can't have any pudding. How can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? What I want you to think about is what pudding means in the context of that statement. Are they actually talking about eating your dinner and having dessert? Or are they perhaps talking about the conditions of society and being um, a contributing member of society so that you can benefit from the rewards that society has to give? So just a little food for thought. And speaking of food, let's talk about what pudding is. Now remember, we're talking about in terms of the United States, how we process normal cultural events. Food is a big part of culture and how we transmit culture. So if I do ask you to describe pudding to me, how do you do it? I would imagine that quite a few of you say it's creamy, it's generally cold, it's sweet, you eat it at the end of a meal, it's a snack, you get it in your lunch when you're in grade school, that kind of thing. But if you go to England and you ask for pudding, you're actually really asking for custard. The word pudding is thought to come from the Old English puddick, which is a steamed bread pudding. Now the one that I'm showing here in the photo is commonly referred to as spotted dick. The word dick comes from puddick and it's spotted because it's spotted with raisins or currants or other things. But it's generally a steamed bread pudding and not a creamy pudding like what we have here in America. The pudding piece of a dessert in England is actually called custard. Likewise, Yorkshire pudding. These are not puddings at all, but they are instead a kind of popover. Uh, my mother, who was born in England and raised in England, commonly still fixes Yorkshire pudding on Christmas Eve for the big family meal. Yorkshire pudding is simple for a British person to make, but here in America, most Americans probably don't even understand what it is, and so it would seem like it's a very hard thing to do. They're quite yummy, and you fill in the little holes of the popover with gravy when you eat your meal. Again, likewise in England, if you're asking for a biscuit with your meal, you're probably going to get something that looks like the picture on the right here, a cookie or a cracker. Whereas in America, when we ask for a biscuit, we're more inclined to think about the thing on the left side here that we can put some butter and jam on, and that's really good to eat. All right, and so now that you're hungry, here's the last slide with food on it. These are pancakes from around the world. And so if you were visiting some other country and you ordered a pancake, you might, if you're American, think you're going to get something that looks like the center bottom photo. But if you're in Finland, you're going to get something that looks like the top left photo, which is called a panukaku. I may be pronouncing that wrong, so please accept my apologies. If you're in a Scandinavian country and order a flapjack, you might get something that looks like the top middle picture, which to us kind of looks like a granola bar. If you're in France, of course, you can expect to get a crepe, which looks like something on the top right. Yummy. And if you're in Russia, you could expect to get something that looks like the bottom left, which are blini or blintzes, which have a little bit of caviar on the top of these particular ones. And if you're in India, you could expect to get a pancake that looks like the bottom right, which are called utapam. Again, excuse me please if I'm butchering the language. 
Uh, these are made with um, fermented rice and lentils, and they have spices and chopped onions mixed in, so much more savory than what we might be used to here in America. I give you these examples because food is an essential part of culture. No matter where you live, no matter what society you are a member of, your foods that you are used to and familiar with help to transmit ideas about who you are, who, who you are as a country, and what kind of cultural values you share. All right, finally, just the last part of this lecture, I wanna talk about the concepts of ethnocentrism and cultural relativism. It's quite important as a researcher of society that we stay neutral when we do our research. We get a lot of training in how to understand and detect our own biases. And we also have to acknowledge that no matter how hard we try, we are going to have an impact on the people that we are studying. And so an important component of the research that we do is to try and remain as neutral as possible, to try and minimize the impact that we're having on groups around us. And a couple of the tools that we can think about are the concepts of ethnocentrism and cultural relativism. In most instances, we want to try to guard against being ethnocentric. Ethnocentrism defined is when we judge others by using our own cultural standards. And it's inappropriate in most cases for us to do that. Instead, we want to try to adopt a stance of cultural relativism. In most cases, we want to allow another individual or another group's culture to remain intact. Um, it's not our job as observers of other groups around the world to dictate to them how they should behave, what they should be doing, how they should be feeling, the foods they should be enjoying. It is instead our job to try to be um, neutral and unbiased and record the actual truth of any given situation. Now you'll note that I did say within most cases because there are times when we as an international community do observe things around the world that we know to be human rights violations. And in those cases, it is our job as researchers to speak out against those kinds of abuses towards others. So while in most instances, we are going to adopt a cultural relativistic approach, there are some cases in limited scope where we might have to be a little bit more ethnocentric in our approach. We make that decision as a research community. It's not my job as an individual researcher to impose my ideas and ideals, but it is my job to make sure that should I see something that doesn't seem right, that seems to violate human rights, that I use my clout as a sociologist to alert human rights organizations or to expose the situation to the research community so that it can be further explored. All right, we'll move on with our next lecture to some final thoughts about culture. Take care.